Okay, my clock just hit 920, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Ramsey. I will be moderating this session. Uh, this presentation was 10 Tips for Optimizing Sakai, and now renamed for Tips for Optimizing Sakai, and it is presented by Earl from Longsight. Uh, if everyone can please keep your microphones muted and cameras off during this presentation, unless you are speaking, um, that would be great. If you have any questions during the session, please enter them into the chat. Feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, Earl, as questions come in, would you like us to address them uh, during that time, or do you want like a little Q&A at the end? No response. I'm sorry. I think uh, uh, I think addressing them at the time would be great. Okay. Sounds good. Um, the session is recorded. It will be available at a later date up on the Sakai YouTube channel. If anyone has problems with their video or audio, please also let me know by entering it into the chat. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Earl. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Today, I hope that this presentation uh, just gives everyone, uh, it, it might be a lot of things people already know, uh, which is totally fine. Um, I'm just hoping that uh, uh, for those that are looking at running Sakai, that you might learn a few um, a few things um, along the way here. And if somebody does have any tips, um, uh, that they would like to add, uh, definitely will be, uh, uh, we should definitely do that at the end. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in here. So, um, so first of all, you know, we have to create, uh, you know, Sakai is a complex, you know, kind of application and we need to, and what we would like to do is, um, you know, run it as best as possible. Um, you know, of course, Sakai depends on a lot of other pieces of software. So those things also have to, you know, be running well as, you know, also in order for Sakai to run well. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, a links in a chain, right? Um, any, if there's a weak link in the chain, um, then, then you're going to have, uh, then that, that area becomes a bottleneck and, um, you know, and it and it will eventually affect. Um, and Sakai will only run as good as that weak link, right? So, so we kind of got you got to look at all a lot of things, not just at Sakai and the JVM, and you know, and how's that running? Of course, that's part of it, but you know, we need to look at uh, you need to look at uh, um, all of these different pieces of software, um, and. Uh, and uh, you know, and optimize them all um, in order to have a successful, uh, well-performing um, Sakai service. So um, the things that were that you typically will look into are, you know, your operating system, uh, your database. Uh, we've got caching, your proxy, um, and of course the JVM. Uh, one thing that you'll definitely want to be doing on all of these fronts is monitoring. Um, so uh, monitoring your Sakai system and all of those other services are are uh, are paramount because you're not going to know uh, if any changes that you make in that system uh, was, you know, had an effect or didn't have an effect if you don't do any monitoring, right? And um, um, so, so it's, it's, it's of utmost importance to be monitoring all parts of the service. Um, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's jump into operating system. So how could we make, you know, what, what are the things, uh, what are the, uh, uh, the key things about the operating system to, uh, you know, <clears throat> to, uh, you know, to look for? Well, as as long as, since we're all running on Linux, that's what I would say. Like ninety percent of people run on Linux. If you run on some other operating system, that is fine. But you're going to have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to um, uh, consult your, uh, you know, for like for example, Windows. If you're running in Windows, um, you know, these options probably won't work. You know, these options are definitely not going to work for you. You're going to have to, uh, you know. Um, Kind of consult some Windows, uh, get 
uh, information on Windows. However, so since most people run Linux though for these kinds of things, this, this, this is what we're covering here. Um, so right out of the gate, one of the things that, you know, an operating system, you know, obviously you've got to have some memory, you got to have some disk. Disk is important, right? Everybody knows this, disk, uh, fast disks are always a good thing. Um, it helps out a lot. Um, and it's something that, um, uh, that is uh, very important. Sometimes Linux comes with um, um, not so many file handles configured. I believe it's like, you know, 8K or something like that out of the box or something like that. Sometimes on some Linuxes, some, some are, I think are more now. Uh, but, you know, if you don't have enough file handles, that's something you'll probably want to increase. Uh, but the thing you'll want to uh, monitor there is uh, likely uh, for disk is IO weight with, uh, and there's a tool called IOSTAT on Linux to help you do this. And if you see that um, disk, uh, that the CPU is waiting like like more than 5% on the IO weight area, right? Um, it's usually a sign of a slow disk. You know, something is slow with the disk, right? And so you'll want to, uh, uh, you'll want to uh, get that addressed. Um, of course, nowadays we have really fast disks, you know, things like that, you know, um, so there, there's, there's, there's many ways to address that. Um, uh, you're going to want to monitor probably another thing that's really important for Java apps is monitoring the swap on the OS. Um, we've got uh, sometimes um, you know, because, uh, like, for example, in the case of Sakai, we give Sakai so much memory, we give Sakai more memory, you know, it's like the process on the system, right? So you give it so much memory, give it like, you know, if you've got 16 gigs of memory, you're going to likely want to give it like 10 of those, right? And so, um, you know, you want to make sure that the OS does not swap out um, any part of your VM, your, your JVM. Uh, memory to you don't want any of that swapped out ever like that's a bad sign so here is some um, so one of the things you'll want to do um, is there's a let's see we'll go to the next slide real quick so to check if your OS is swapping or your process is swapping um, there's um, this is just a little bash script that will uh, uh, kind of um, look for uh, all programs that are being swapped and it will just print them out on the screen. And if you happen to see uh, your Java process in that list, that's a that's an indicator that, uh, you know, that it's being swapped out. And if that's the case, uh, you'll want to, um, you know, adjust these uh, VM settings, um, you know, to help, uh, to help, uh, you know, reduce the amount to reduce the amount of swapping that is that is that occurs. But this is something to watch out for um, swap. Um, it's probably the one area that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, can really slow down the JVM and um, uh, you know, without, you know, without you really knowing it. Again, this is something that should be monitored, right? You'll know if you're if you start, if you're monitoring your Linux system, you'll know when you're, you know, where your swap stands at all times, you know. So if you start, you know, if you're at zero swap and then all of a sudden, you you know, you start jumping up in the swap area, you want to you want to check and make sure it's not your JVM being swapped out. So that's the main thing there. And of course, uh, uh, with operating system, you'll definitely want to monitor your network right your tcp send and receive buffers that kind of stuff hopefully people are configuring um their sakai systems with like local uh with like dedicated networks that are when i mean dedicated i mean they're not networks that are shared by a bunch of other uh you know services or equipment or what have you you know you you'll want uh you know you you want to um kind of give your your Sakai systems uh, you know a a network that's you know specific to them um, and for example connect that to the database connect you know 
um, specific to each node and specific to the database so that this way um, you know they don't have they don't run into the issue of uh, uh, competing with network resources those kinds of things so it's another it's another area to monitor of course monitoring this will go a long way at telling you you know how you're doing but again you know like this day and age you know networks are you know are, are uh, pretty fast so um, uh, anyway monitoring will go a long way to to uh, to helping with that so let's move on from operating system and let's go to uh, let's jump to proxies so HTTP proxies why is an HTTP proxy uh, important um, it's First of all, like proxies are like, you know, an HTTP Swiss army knife, right? I mean, you can do so many things with proxies. It's like the one thing, uh, it's, it's just such a cool tool to have. Um, you'll, def you'll definitely not want your Tomcats exposed to the world, right? You'll want your proxies exposed to the world, right? And your Tomcat servers will be behind closed doors, you know, behind firewalls and such things like that, right? Um, and it's your proxy that kind of stands out there, right? And uh, and it and that's its job to do to do that to serve as the you know the uh, the gateway to uh, to your application servers. Um, one of the most uh, useful things when it comes to Sakai is, you know, you'll want to run SSL and you want to offload your SSL at your proxy, right? Dr. Chuck asks, what proxy would be, uh, so there's many good ones out there, right? I don't have a kind of like a, a guide on, you know, which one's better than, you know, than, than others. Um, but I think any capable proxy that's out there, you know, um, you know, I know we use Nginx, right? But Nginx is kind of like, you know, been out there forever and it's a really great proxy, but there's a lot of other good ones, you know, um, you know, uh, so it's not so much about which one to use, just uh, whichever one that you, you this is like, uh, you know, some kind of shops, they'll say, oh, we use, you know, this database. And some will say, oh, we use these these proxies, right? Like, you know, the ones from F5 or whatever. It's totally good to just, you know, use the proxy that you're comfortable with. But yeah, Longsight uses Nginx. So the big, one of the big things is offloading SSL at your proxy. You don't really want uh, your JVM to be doing SSL. Um, you know, it's like, why have it do that chore when your proxy can do it? The, the, probably the, the, ni the, the nice thing is that your proxy will be using the libs to do SSL, right, from your operating system, right? So in the case of Linux, it's going to be like OpenSSL, right? And um, you're going to be using the open, OpenSSL that's, that's on your system. And, and that stuff is generally pretty darn fast. It's all in C, right? It's, it's really fast. Um, could you could you have Tomcat be doing that? Sure, you could, but the SSL um, in the JVM, which is JSSE, um, just isn't as fast. It just it's a known thing. It's not as fast as OpenSSL. Um, that's native on the system. Um, supposedly, that's supposed to be changing, but um, you know they're trying to make improvements there. But you know what? Uh, I I don't. I don't think, uh, I think offloading that at your proxy is a really good thing to do. I don't know. Does anybody else have any, um, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, does anybody, has anybody tried doing, you know, you know, not, does, has anybody heard of something, you know, not doing that as like, I, I'd like, that's something I've always done. So. Yeah. So one one thing about uh, um, you want to do is make sure you're using new I/O and new I new I/O two connectors. The, those are uh, the Tomcat connectors, and they are faster than like the APR the traditional APR connector, um, and they're definitely faster than um, 
like I said, um, those connectors with with SSL. So, and of course, at your proxy, you're going to be doing load balancing. So it serves that other important purpose, right? Say you got five, six nodes, Sakai nodes, you need something to load balance that stuff, right? And a proxy is going to be doing that chore anyways. So, um, so that's 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 your proxy. Um, So I think the main takeaway for the proxy is just make sure you're doing SSL um, on your, you're offloading your SSL on your proxy. That's, that's the tip there. Uh, all right, so let's, let's jump into the JVM. So, uh, uh, so now, so we're going to talk a little bit here about um, tuning, you know, Sakai for the JVM. Um, but in order to, in order to, uh, before, uh, jump, diving into that, we need we kind of need to understand how Sakai, uh, you know, works as an application in the JVM, right? So that's that's uh, this is going to be an important an important topic to understand. So uh, your cache. So one of the things um, to understand about the Sakai application is um, is real quick is, is caches. In the, in the Java virtual machine, they occupy large amounts of the heap, right? So this is like your EH cache. Um, these caches that all they do is store data, that's all they do, they will end up uh, in your heap and they will, and they'll likely, and they'll end up in, um, um, in your tenured space and they will be consuming large amounts of data right? Sometimes a gig, two gigs, and, and sometimes even a little more, right? And this is kind of, this is kind of, uh, it's important to understand that uh, these caches exist in Sakai, okay? And it's important to understand that they occupy large amounts of the heap, okay? Um, uh, <clears throat> so services, so Sakai services, um, they will normally uh, start with Sakai and they'll be there for the entire life of the application, right? So they start up and they don't stop until Sakai stops. And uh, most of all of these services, they will also end up in tenured or old, okay? So this is also important to understand. Um, so now the thing that Sakai is providing to the, uh, is really um, uh, the requests that users make to it, right? Users log in, user does this, user does that. All of these things uh, 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 get, uh, end up becoming requests, right? The request that comes in. So Sakai and Tomcat is just serving these requests to your users all the time. And what and and from a memory standpoint, what are you know, what does a request typically uh, 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 you know consume? And uh, a request comes in, generally speaking, what what will end up happening is a lot of objects will typically get created uh, to handle that request, right? Um, you know, it doesn't matter what tool in Sakai they're accessing or anything like that. Um, but all tools have to create objects to service the requests and to fulfill those requests. Sometimes more objects are created, um, uh, you know, from certain requests than others, but or sometimes some objects are, you know, very large to, you know, need to be created. Large objects need to be, need to be created in order to service a request. The important thing to know about requests in general is that all these objects that get created, um, when the request is finished, which is in milliseconds, right, typically um, under a second, they all generally, almost like 99.9% .9 of them will be garbage collected. Okay, that's the important thing to know about requests is that they get created for the to service the request to fulfill it and then when that request is gone 
and it's been then the response is sent back to the user all of that memory uh, will get garbage collected okay and uh, so uh, this is an important note because we're going to talk about that in a little bit generational so let's so we're going to touch on um, generational garbage collectors generational garbage collectors are are simply gar garbage collectors that use a um, different spaces of memory to do uh, to store different types of of uh, objects in them and when it's generational what they really what they're saying there is it is an age thing right so you know the the young generation um, also referred to as Eden a lot um, uh, you know there's a you know a space in, there's a space in the JVM that's set up uh, for these young objects and these young objects are the ones that just get created and what creates uh, and I just went over this but what creates a lot of a lot of objects requests to right so requests are creating large amounts of these objects uh, another space in in Sakai is the old area or tenured sometimes referred to and the uh and this is where things that survive the young the young or you know the young uh, uh space and they survive it and they end up in the old space right um one of the things to know about generational garbage collector is the young generation is particularly really 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 fast to collect to do garbage collection and that's a really great thing the old is typically it always i've i've never seen an old take go faster than a young collection right a collection that occurs in the young space old always takes longer i don't know why that is but it <laughs> <I'm> just <laughs> it's it's generally because these are the things that uh, there are usually a lot of pointers to things uh, like your services. Uh, a lot of a lot of these things that end up in old are generally going to be things that are there for the life of the JVM, for the life of the Sky application, and they're going to end up in old, and that's a good place for them to end up. Also, your uh, your caches end up in old. Okay, remember we're going to talk about a little bit about that cache stuff in old here in a little bit. Uh, but anyway, so we have these generations, you know, these, these, you know, the young and the old, and uh, it just so happens the young collects really fast, um, and it holds all the, all the, you know, objects that are, that are, you know, that, that have a very young age, right? Um, I hope that you know you you should start to start to see a connection here between a Sakai application server between Sakai and the JV you know and how you know what, how the Sakai application works and the JVM and its collection right I'm start I'm trying to you know create these a little bit of like uh, these lines to it. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> what kind of <clears throat> the kind of collector that is that works really well with Sakai <clears throat> or that you'll want to use with Sakai is a low pause collector. This is always important. Low pause collectors simply mean that they don't pause or they, or when they do pause, they pause for very, very, very tiny amounts of time. Usually we're talking milliseconds. Um, hopefully we're not talking, you know, seconds. Um, <clears throat> although it will, it will happen from time to time. But um, uh, you really want um, a low pause collector where all of the collecting is happening concurrently. And that's usually how they attain this within the JVM is that it's not that they're not doing less in the collecting, it's just they're doing it concurrently while the JV, you know, while the JVM is running. <clears throat> so low pause collectors, those those are the collectors that work really well with Sakai. New, there are some, so just to touch on the last item there, which is um, 
uh, in the newer JVMs, right, we've got newer garbage collectors coming, um, which many of you probably already heard, like Shenandoah and ZGC. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of great uh, innovation that's happening there. Um, however, I have, I've heard that generational versions of these new garbage collectors are also on the way. So there will be a generational Shenandoah collector. There will be a generational ZGC. Currently, these collectors, Shenandoah and ZGC, Shenandoah is available on, on uh, Java 11. And ZGC is, on, is uh, experimental um, and is available in Java 17. So, um, so when we get to Java 17, it is kind of known that ZGC is the collector. Um, it's going to be the like the collector to use. Um, these collectors are extremely low pausing collectors. They they guarantee that they will not pause. Um, you know, for uh, if you, I should say, when they say guarantee, what they say is that they will as long as you give your application enough memory to operate with, they will guarantee that the pausing will be kept to, um, you know, like under 200 milliseconds, something like that, which is like really awesome. Um, so, you know, why aren't we just jumping on these, on these collectors? Well, you know, they're new. Um, and, um, you know, we have so much experience with CMS, which is the current concurrent mark sweep collector in Java, you know, that, you know, that we've, that we've come accustomed to since, you know, for a very long time. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to take baby steps when switching to some of these collectors. The, the, the thing to know about Shenandoah and ZGC is that they are, um, um, they are not currently, they're not generational collectors. So meaning um, they don't have like young and old, they just have, you know, the heap, and um you know the application operates within that heap and they do collection within that uh, the entire heap okay so um but um they are going to be introducing generational versions of these collectors i think what they've seen is that um while these collectors are very good at what they do um adding generational to them increases their performance even more uh, is that's that's how i understand it um the one thing that these collectors do really really well uh, there's a lot of things they do really well over let's say like uh the old the the, the kind of the collectors we've come used to um even like cms um is they handle now large memory systems, memory systems with large amounts of memory given to the JVM. So gigs and gigs, you know, like uh, 100, 100 gig VMs, things like that. Um, these collectors, uh, CMS was never good at that. Um, CMS was never good at uh, VMs with lots of memory, you know, 32 gig, you know, 32 gig VMs, you know, 64 gig VMs, you know, not, you know, just CMS was just never really good at that because the more memory that it has, which is great for it to operate with, but the longer it takes to collect all of that, all of those things. And that, and that was the downside to CMS. That was, that, that was, or I should say collectors in the JVM previously to these. Um, it, they just never really dealt with large memory very well. Um, so you had to keep your VMs like, you know, kind of on the on the smaller side. You know, that's why you'll see a lot of VMs running eight gigs, 16 gigs, typically, you know, in that range, um, because it's uh, generally, you know, it's just they're generally better. Um, they're, uh, they run faster. Uh, when I say faster, they uh, they don't spend all that time collecting. Uh, like on the large ones. However, Shenandoah and ZGC fixed that problem. 
right? That that's the main problem they fix. So now you can have you know hundreds of gigs of a VM, a VM with hundreds of gigs, and the the pausing is you know milliseconds, which is which is amazing. So they fixed all of those problems in these new collectors, which is great. Um, we just haven't had, I would say from my, my personally, I hope, you know, I don't know if anybody else out there, but personally, I've not had the chance to run, uh, say, uh, a Sakai system with like, you know, 64 gig VM and see how that goes. Um, I just haven't had the chance to do that. So I, I don't have that sort of data for you. So again, this is where when you're monitoring and maybe you set up one of your nodes to to be you know Shenandoah for example, uh, um, and you know and then you monitor it to see how well it does right compared to your let's say so in your Sakai system you can have nodes that are running CMS right, and then you can have like a couple of Shenandoah nodes as well, um, but I suspect that those systems will run better with large VM with large larger amounts of memory. So, you know, like 32 gig plus kind of thing. So it would be, it would be, it would be nice. Um, I, again, I don't have the information for, for running that yet. Cause I haven't had the chance to do that yet. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to jump to, so I guess, um, so what I did here was, is I kind of listed what, um, the current versions of Java, like that Sakai that we use is Java 8 and Java 11, right? So if you're on 21 and earlier, you're using Java 8. If you're on Sakai 22 and later, you're going to be using Java 11. Um, concurrent mark sweep is still in JDK 11. So, um, and I would recommend continuing to use that um, um, unless you're, you know, uh, will unless you have, you know, you're ready to attempt uh, running one of the newer collectors. Um, so the options here, these are just some of the options to be. So in this particular case, this is a 10 gig VM. Okay. Uh, this would be like on a server with 16 gigs is, is likely where this would, uh, this would be used. So you've got to give, you know, some memory to your, to your, to your operating system. You got to give some memory to uh, the JDK. So we give 10 gigs to the JDK. Uh, we set up a new size of four gigs. Uh, one, one interesting note on the newer uh, garbage collect, on newer VMs, just in general, they're running um, on the generational collectors, they're running large size now. Like the JVM by default used to run with like, it was like one sixth of the memory, I think it was, something like that, or one seventh of the total memory they've changed that now like the jdk by default will run a much larger new size um as you can see here four gig of 10 gig that's almost half right we're, we're pretty close to half um and that's a really good a four gig new size is really good the new the new here this is the young area right so this is young young is four gig we subtract it from the total of 10 gig and that gives us a six gig old okay so we have a six a 60 40 split here um is what you is is the way to look at that um and what uh um and and so having a, a good size new size is going to be really good because this is the area where all of the requests are handled is in this new size area Right. Remember, this is the young area. Requests come in, objects get created, and then for that request, and then they're done. Right. All of that happens in this new size. If you size this too small, like a lot of I've seen a lot of people size this to like 1G or even 2G, right? It's too small. It's just too small. You're 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 having the v you're you're causing the jvm to uh to have to do more work by not sizing it correctly it's essentially what's happening um because what it if you size it too small it means it has to move things into old and if you're moving some of those young objects into old 
uh, when the request ends, then they have to get collected. Well, they're gonna sit in old until old fills up to the 72% range here. That's what this number is. So when old gets to 72%, then it's gonna issue an old collect, uh, a full, what's called a full collection, right? And what's gonna, you know, and then it's going to collect the, the six gig old area, right? And if you can keep the young objects out of the old area, right? That's a good, that's a good thing to be doing, right? You know, you don't want them to be uh, promoted into old, right? You want them to, to live and die, if you will, in the young area, which is this area, right? That's, that's the key there. That's the key to a really good, to really tuning the JVM um, with a generational collector is to make sure that all your young objects uh, uh, begin their life and die or get collected, I should say, in the young area. And all of the objects that are gonna be around for the life of the application, like all your services and things like that, that are in Sakai, that, that are there from the moment it starts, you want all of that stuff to be in old. That's because that makes, that's the right place for it to end up, right? So anyway, so let me see, what, let me do a time check. You got four uh, minutes me, left, Earl. Four minutes. So let me let me uh, put this into gear here. <laughs> so these are the Shenandoah options, okay? The generational Shenandoah. This oops. This this would be the this this would be the Shen, uh, the generational Shenandoah options uh, right here. When the, uh, when this comes out, this is currently experimental. Just to note. But I would really recommend running a generational the uh, garbage collection because it is what maps to Sakai's usage. So it's just how it works. So let's. I'm going to try to go through these uh, few, just a couple more slides, really quick. So for your databases, that's another area that you need to monitor. It's another area that you need to look into. Um, the best way to make your database run well, in my opinion, is put it on Amazon because Aurora is so dang on good and you don't have to do anything. It'll just work and it works well. It's tuned, it's optimized and, and you've got uh, Amazon that takes care of all of that stuff for you, right? That's one way. If, if you wanna do it your own way, right? Then there's been this automatic that's called the MySQL tuner script that's been out there forever. It works with MariaDB too, works with all flavors of MySQL. Um, you'll definitely wanna run that script uh, and you'll want to um, basically monitor your queries, right, for um, slow queries, right? And whenever you find queries, you know, you want to increase, you know, you want to make them more performant. We do that by adding indexes. We do that by uh, these couple of things here. Um, uh, <clears throat> and they, the other great thing is use a cache versus querying the database, right? So that's that's another uh, that's another tactic, right? If I don't have to actually hit the database, and I hit and I get my get what I need from a cache, that's always better because caches come from memory. So let's jump into that. Caches, caches coming. So caching brings huge performance improvements because it avoids going across a network to a database, right? It it avoids that, um, and it comes from memory. Uh, the caches can be, you know, the data that that is in them is served um, via memory. So it's it's got it's at the speed of memory, right? Uh, with Sakai 21, as everybody knows, Ignite was introduced, and we now have distributed caches. This is a huge performance boost as well, because um, you only have a single cache instead of like, you know, there's there's some people out there that have like 20 some, 30 some Sakai nodes right? And they all have their all individual own caches. Well, and it, when you introduce Ignite into a, a, an area like that, you're going to have really big performance increase because, because now it's not every node has its own cache. It is all the nodes use the same cache, right? It's not 30, it's not you know, 20 Sakai nodes and 20 different caches 
it's a single cache for all 20 nodes. Um, and the way that that is, uh, so that cache is always warm because if you shut down a node or you add a node, it doesn't matter that that is always warm. The cache is warm because it just joins. Oh, and the cache is there and it has a lot of data in it already. That's great. Um, the other great thing about that is all nodes have the same data. There is no cache skew. You know, that's, that's, the th that's, a, that's a huge problem that Sakai suffered from by having cache, separate caches on each node. Um, it would take time for things to time out and to requery the database to get updated data. That no longer happens. That's, that's, that's a thing of the past. Um, um, so the other thing about Ignite is um, since Sakai, uh, just know that Ignite is in a replicated, what we call a replicated mode, um, and that favors heavy read, which, which is what exactly what Sakai does. Uh, you've got an instructor that creates some content and lessons and how many students go and read that content and how many times. They probably go, probably each student accesses that stuff hundreds of times and times that by how many students you have, right? So you've got one person creating content and hundreds and hundreds of accesses that read that data, right? Sakai is a heavy, uh, is a, uh, it does, it favors heavy reads, right? So we put it in a replicated mode. Um, and the other beautiful thing about Ignite is it stores that data off heap. So remember, traditionally EH caches store it in the JVM heap, which takes away from the JVM, you know, sort of size. Um, Ignite stores all that data off heap in the in system memory. So, um, which is a really nice feature as well. Um, I gotta hurry. <laughs> Just remember monitoring, so important. It's this is the most important thing you can do is monitor things because if you make changes how are you going to know if anything got better if you're not monitoring it's just it's like that simple so um make sure you're monitoring everything your os your jvm your database your network all of those kinds of things okay Derek, questions <laughs> if we I have time anything else. i didn't think anything <laughs> else came in uh we do have eight minutes um till our next uh presentation starts um so i mean if somebody had a, a question or two as long as we get everybody out of here in the next two or three minutes uh if not you know earl thank you so much for the presentation um like i said we have about eight minutes to the first round of lightning talks uh start um so do we have any last minute questions here for earl before we break to jump off to the lightning talks Did Matt, did you keep count of how many tips I had? I counted didn't... seven and a half, but I don't know oh, if Matt got see the that? Same. I didn't even make 10. Matt's mad. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anything else come in. Uh, thank you so much, Earl, uh, for that. Matt's typing. He may have an actual count here. <laughs> Partial refund from Matt for the missing tips. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you at the next session here in about uh, six or seven minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.